first moved to New York City, I thought I knew why I was coming here. It was going to be an adventure. I had my own agenda. I had no idea how much I would fall in love with the kids of the city and how much they would teach me about myself and change my life. I treasure my morning commutes on the subway. It's my time. Sometimes it's my only time with God. In those moments, I know his love for me, and I know that that's going to carry on throughout my day, and I know it's going to help me to do my job well. The Bronx is one of the toughest neighborhoods in the country. 75% of the people live below the poverty line, and where there's poverty, of course, there's going to be violence and sadness and strife, ugliness. Right in the middle of the Bronx is Middle School 223, where I'm a reading and writing teacher to sixth graders. It's where I spend my days every day. A lot of our kids at our school go home to shelters. They go home to homes where they are in charge. They see people get shot in front of their apartment door. Life has not been easy for them or kind to them. Morning. Good morning. Hey guys. Thanks for coming in quietly. Many of my students haven't been loved well. They've been abandoned. They've been promised things that have never come. They've been promised relationships with their fathers or mothers that have never happened. And so they're just worn. They're weathered. And they don't trust love. On the first day of school, the first thing that I tell them is, I've been thinking about you all summer. Like, I love you already. You may not believe this, but you can't earn my love. You could make straight A's all year and have perfect behavior all year, or you can get detention three times a week, and I'm going to love you the same. And then I spend all year trying to prove it. I want you to think back to Monday. We chose that one personal narrative that we're going to publish and celebrate and put out there to the world. Who am I as a person? What do I really want people to know about who I am? Well, it wasn't until recently that I realized that God had been preparing me for this job, for these kids at the school right now. I grew up in Georgia, mostly at my grandmother's house because my mom and dad were divorced. And then when my dad got married, I felt like I wasn't good enough. He, he wanted me to be perfect. I just wasn't good enough anymore. But I know I don't need other people to say I'm okay anymore. I did that my whole life, and I think I'm finally done. So maybe now I can just be Lindsay, and if I make mistakes, then oh well. I'm not only as good as what I do. Growing up, and especially now, even as an adult, I still long for that love and acceptance, and God has shown that to me and given that to me so that I can go and give these kids the same love and acceptance that they have always wanted, too. Over time, I really do believe this classroom becomes a safe haven for them, a place where they feel accepted, and they know they're going to be safe and it's comfortable. I think God loves these kids so much, more than I could ever hope to love them. But I think he wants them to rest and to be happy. I think he wants to heal their hearts. Every day they walk out of my classroom, and at the end of the year, they walk out of my classroom forever. It's so hard. It's hard not knowing what lies ahead for them or what type of choices they'll make. And I just have to rest. I've done everything I could do. I've loved them the best that I can. And my hope is that they'll figure out that God loves them so much more than I ever could. What a, what a great video.
of Lindsay demonstrating overflowing generosity. So, so I kind of wanted to ask you, so, so this is the time for you to participate. Brad's going to come and Brad's going to take the microphone here. So somebody tell me, how did Lindsay demonstrate overflowing generosity to the kids in her classroom? Anybody? Anybody? Come on, I need you to participate, all right? How did, how, how did, how did Lindsay demonstrate overflowing generosity? By offering love without asking for anything in return. Okay, offering love and not asking anything in return. Fantastic. Somebody else. How did Lindsay offer uh, overflowing generosity? Well, she told these kids that she loved them before she ever knew them. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't that great? So she never met those kids before. She told them she loved them and was praying for them all year long. So somebody else. She said she loved you whether you were straight A or you got detention three times a week. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many teachers we have in our auditorium today, but I imagine it's a little bit more difficult to love somebody who gets detention three times a week than it is to love a straight-A student, right? Anybody else? How did Lindsay demonstrate love? Anybody else have a response? Anybody else? One more. One more. If we can get the microphone to her. Compassion. By compassion. By demonstrating compassion. Excellent. 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 Thank you, Brad. You did a great job running the microphone all over the place. Let's give Brad a hand. Huh? It's actually in Brad's job description that that's something that he does on a regular basis. huh? No, thank you, Brad. I'm joking. So, so here's what I wanted you to see with that video, and we'll flesh it out a little bit today. Whole life generosity, this, this overflowing generosity is more than just faithful giving. It's more than, you know, making sure that you put your giving envelope in the offering on Sunday morning. It involves more than your money. Whole life generosity entails every area of your life. And that's the way God wants us to live as followers of him, for us to be characterized by generosity. Last week, Brad began with this definition, and I want to put it up on the screen again. So, whole life generosity is an overflowing way of being and living rooted in a vibrant relationship with God that gratefully releases all in love to bless others. It's what God does and it's how we want to live. So would you do that? Would you do this with me? Let's read that together. Can we read that together? I'm not going to have you memorize it the next couple of weeks, but I want it to kind of sink into your mind and heart. So read it with me. Whole life generosity is an overflowing way of being and living rooted in a vibrant relationship with God that grateful releases all in love to bless others. It's what God does, and it's how we want to live. That truth is clearly seen in the passage of Scripture that we are studying today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you have your iPhone, your iPad, we'll put it up on the screen. But I really want to encourage you to bring your Bibles and follow along, whatever form you bring them in. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Before we read the verses that we're studying today, let me just give a little bit of review. Brad kind of gave the overview of this passage last week. But, but Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers on behalf of the saints in Jerusalem. The, the followers of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem were experiencing hardship and they were experiencing poverty. And as a result, the Apostle Paul was determined to raise funds to help them. If you want to see, that's found for the very first time in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, or, or excuse me, in, in 1 Corinthians 16, and it's also seen in the book of Acts as the Apostle Paul has this burden. As Paul mentioned last week, the Corinthian or as Brad mentioned last week, the Corinthian believers were well off. And they had made a commitment to help. But as of yet, they had not fulfilled their commitment. I kind of stopped there for a second and scratched my head and I asked myself, how many times have I made a commitment to God? Whether it was to do something or to give something or to be a certain way, and I didn't fulfill my commitment. That's exactly what was taking place with the Corinthians. They'd made a commitment to help the suffering saints in Jerusalem, and as of yet, they haven't fulfilled their commitments. 
So as a result, Paul writes to them to encourage them to generously help out their brothers and their sisters in Jerusalem. That's actually what chapters 8 and 9 are about, is the Apostle Paul exhorts the Corinthian believers to generosity. And by the way, the Corinthian believers, it wasn't just this poor group of people. They were well off. It was one of the wealthiest cities in the then known world. If anybody had the means to be generous, it was the Corinthians. Yet... They failed to demonstrate that generosity. And Paul shows us here in this passage that in contrast, a group of people who weren't well off were generous in what God had given them. So notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I want to read just the first seven verses, and then we'll dive in, we'll understand the passage, and I want to, I want to pull it together with a couple of really practical truths for all of us this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we want you to know brothers, or brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches in Macedonia. We'll explain who that is in just a second. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, notice the paradox there. In a severe test of affliction, their what? Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as they are not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. And then by the will of God to us, accordingly we urge Titus that as he had started, so he would complete among you this act of grace." But as you excel in everything, in faith, in knowledge, in earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Would you pray with me today? Father, we, um, we echo the words of the last song that we just sang. Give us Jesus. Lord, more than the things that this world offers us, all of us need Jesus in our lives. It doesn't matter whether we've been believers for 40 years or whether we're a brand new follower of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether we understand the truths of the gospel or whether we're just beginning to contemplate them. It doesn't matter if we serve in the church or whether we're new to the church. All of us need Jesus. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take the truth of this passage and drive it home to our hearts. Help us to be generous like Jesus. And as we demonstrate whole life overflowing generosity, Father, I pray that you would use us. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So so we take the word or the theme overflowing with generosity for a reason because the word overflow is actually found several times in our passage. Did you see it? Did you notice it as we went through? So in verse 2, it says, talking about the, for the Macedonians, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity. And then as you jump down to verse 7, Paul encourages them. He said, but as you excel, the word excel there literally means overflow. That's what the Greek word means. So as you overflow in everything, as you overflow in faith, as you overflow in knowledge, as you overflow in earnestness, and as you overflow in love, see that you overflow in this grace also. So the challenge for us is how can you and I who are believers in the 21st century who live in this great country, the United States of America, how can we overflow with generosity? Well, Paul gives examples of how we can and should do that in the passage. And so if you have your outline in front of you, the very first thing we say is this. We see the example of others should motivate us to overflow with generosity. And you remember, Paul actually gives two examples in this passage. And Brad alluded to the first example last week, and so I don't want to go back there too much because he did such a great job. But the first thing that Paul says is that you and I should imitate Jesus. 
That's our challenge, to imitate Jesus. And remember verse 9, it said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. What a tremendous visual illustration of the gospel. Jesus, who is incredibly rich, who is in heaven with all the splendor and all the attention and everything of heaven, left the wealth of heaven and he humbled himself, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, and he became one of us and he humbled himself so much unto death. Though he was rich, he became poor. Why would Jesus do that? So that we who were poor might become rich. And the idea in the passage, Brad said, is not that you and I have a lot of money in our bank account or not that we buy a new car every year or not that we have wonderful jewelry. The wealth that the Apostle Paul is talking about is that spiritual wealth, that spiritual peace, that spiritual joy that is only found in Jesus Christ. And very simply, the idea is this. Jesus left heaven and came to earth so that those of us who are living here on earth can one day go to heaven and be with him. The generosity of Jesus. Are you thankful today for the generosity of Jesus? Have you told him that? Where would you be? Where would I be today if it wasn't for the overwhelming generosity of Jesus who graciously, I love the word that Jonas used, lavishes his love on us day in and day out. Paul says this, imitate Jesus in your life. But he gives us a second example, and that second example is found in the passage of Scripture that we read this morning. He says, not only imitate Jesus, but he says, learn from the example of the Macedonians. So once again, in verse 1, Paul said, we want you to know about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So, so, so that we know exactly to whom the Apostle Paul is referring, I put a map up on the screen because the churches in Macedonia were found in several areas. They were found in Philippi, they were found in Thessalonica, and there's another city there that was the city of Berea. You know those churches because Paul wrote the epistle of the Philippians to the church of Philippi. He wrote First and Second Thessalonians to the church at Thessalonica, and he commends the church at Berea because they studied the scriptures. And so Paul says, listen, I want you to understand how God's grace is demonstrated in those churches in Macedonia. And he says that, that, that they went through two things. If you saw it in the passage, first of all, he said that they suffered a test of affliction. Did you see that in verse 2? He says, for in a severe test of affliction. Now notice, the words of Scripture are incredibly important. He not only uses the word affliction, but he uses the word test. And he not only uses the word test, but he uses the word severe test. So as these believers were striving to follow Jesus Christ and grow in their faith, they were experiencing a severe test of affliction. Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Notice what Paul says. For you, brothers, speaking to the Thessalonians who were in Macedonia, for you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets who drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind. So Paul tells the Corinthians who were affluent, who were living the good life, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to... See the grace of God that is being bestowed not on believers of influence, but the grace of God that is being bestowed on believers that are going through severe persecution. Just just study the first century church. And and you'll see how believers who were living in the Roman Empire, at least in the beginning, had to, at times, give their own lives for the faith. They They were spread out because of the persecution from Jerusalem. And they literally were being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But the second thing Paul says is they not only were suffering a test of affliction, but they experienced extreme poverty. Notice verse 2, in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme 
poverty. Depending upon the translation you have, the NASB and the King James says their deep poverty. Here's what Paul is saying, that these believers weren't just going through a temporary hardship. It wasn't like, okay, it's the end of the month and we ran out of money, so we got to hold on for a couple of days until the paycheck comes. Paul says that they were experiencing deep, profound, long-term poverty. So, 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 so catch this. We're going to get practical in a second, but we got to dive into the passage. We've got to understand what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, listen, if anybody would have had an excuse to not be generous, who would it have been? The Macedonians. They were being persecuted for their faith. They were experiencing not just poverty, they were experiencing deep poverty. And Christian historians tell us that they were experiencing deep probably poverty, most probably because the heads of the household were in prison and the women were the ones who were trying to sustain the families. If you notice, as Paul was beginning these churches, many times he would meet with just a group of women. And you sit back and say, man, why was that? Because the men were in prison for their faith. Paul said, these Macedonian believers, they're suffering affliction. They're experiencing deep poverty. If anyone would have had an an excuse to not participate in this offering, it would have been the Macedonians. But they responded in a way that was completely unexpected. Paul says this, and this is the exact phrase. He said, their poverty overflowed into a wealth of generosity. Did you see that? That's a paradox. It's something that doesn't make sense. Their poverty overflowed into a wealth of generosity. From a human perspective, that doesn't make much sense. You would think, as I've already mentioned, that persecution and poverty would cause families to look inward, to think of their own needs, to use their resources to survive kind of what we do, right? When money gets tight, what do we do? We trim the budget. We cut back on our spending. We limit our giving. Not the Macedonians. Notice two phrases. We've already alluded to them. Notice two phrases that Paul uses that explain the reason for their liberality. In verse 2, I'm not going to put it up on the screen. Find it in your Bibles. In verse 2, he mentions an abundance of joy. So while they were experiencing severe persecution, they also were demonstrating an abundance of joy. Man, that's amazing to me. So their mentality wasn't, for our Spanish speakers, it wasn't pobrecito de mí. It wasn't, poor me. I'm, I'm suffering and God, where are you? You've abandoned me. I've lost my joy. I'm depressed. No, in the midst of persecution, they were experiencing real joy. So much so that they abounded in joy. They were joyful even in the midst of suffering and even in the midst of scarcity. There's a second phrase that Paul uses, and it's in verse 4. Paul says, begging us earnestly for the favor of participating. I read that, and you guys know that I'm kind of weird when I read passages of Scripture. I read that, and the first thought that came to my mind was, what? (laughs) Here's a group of people that if there was a food pantry, they would have been in line at the food pantry. Here's a group of people that had serious needs, and they are begging Paul, pleading with Paul, don't ignore us when it comes to this offering. We want to have a part in taking care of the needs of the saints in Jerusalem that are suffering. I read that and I wrote down, how in the world could they respond that way? It doesn't make sense. And the simple truth is this. They didn't allow their situation to stifle their generosity. They didn't allow their circumstances to keep them from living and being like Jesus Christ. I've read that passage a lot. I have to confess, I am convicted Every time I read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, it makes me question my own personal selfishness. It it makes me question my own source of joy. Where, Where do I get joy from? 
Can I be joyful in the midst of persecution? If I didn't have two cars in the driveway, if I didn't have a closet full of clothes, if I didn't have money in the bank account, could I still be joyful? What if Vicki and I were separated because of persecution? Could I still be joyful? I read this, and I am extremely convicted. So let me just share a couple of really practical lessons that, that, that you and I can learn from the Macedonian believers that I think will help us to live this life of whole life, overflowing generosity so that every single day we can demonstrate the generosity and the compassion and the love and the giving heart of Jesus Christ. How can we do that? Notice if you have your outlines in front of you, the second thing I wrote is this. We can only do that if we don't allow our circumstances to keep us from overflowing with generosity. We can only do that if we don't allow our circumstances to keep us from overflowing with generosity. Now, let me just be a little transparent today. So I'm not only a teacher and a preacher. So as I stand up here, my mind and heart is not only on the message and the passage and the preparation that we put in, but I'm also a great observer of people. As a matter of fact, for example, as I observe everyone on Sundays, I pretty much know where everyone sits. So, so I know that Sharon sits down front. I know that Vicki generally sits right here. Glenn's right here. Ted and him are over here. Ray's over here. I know pretty much where everybody sits. If you really want to throw me off, sit somewhere completely different. You ever just see me up speaking and all of a sudden I just kind of focus in? It's like I see somebody who's not supposed to be there. They're supposed to be over here and they're, and they're here. I'm, a, I'm an observer of people as I sit and stand in front of hundreds of you every single week. I can't help but observe it. I, I know where you sit. I know the topics that excite you. And, and, and so for some of you as I preach on this, man, that really gets your juices flowing. And, and that really speaks to your heart. And, and, and somebody else, I'll speak on this subject, or Brad will, or Jose will, and that really gets you going. And that one topic really motivates that. As I sit back and speak, I, I observe and I know that. You say, Brian, so what in the world does that have to do? Because whenever we speak on stewardship, whenever we speak on giving or on generosity, I can read facial expressions. And I can, I can see sometimes like the holy hush that kind of goes over the auditorium, just like, oh my word, here he goes again, right? And by the way, we only do this once a year, once every other year. We don't do it on a regular basis. But in addition, I've spoken to many people in our congregation who have made statements like this. You know, Pastor Brian, I would be generous, and, and I'm not just talking about your giving to the church, I'm talking about this whole life generosity. I would be generous if I had a better job. If I had a better job, I would demonstrate generosity. Or Pastor Brian, if we didn't have so many bills as a family, I would be able to be generous. Or if we didn't have health problems, we're dealing with health problems. If we didn't have health problems, I would be generous. Oh, Brian, if my adult kids weren't living at home, can I get an amen? Anybody know that? Uh, I could be a little bit more generous. Or if my kids weren't in college, I could be more generous. Or if I didn't have a mortgage, I could be more generous. We sit back and say, if this, if that, if whatever, and we allow our circumstances to hinder our generosity. By the way, can I tell you that statistics prove otherwise? Statistics prove that if you don't give when you have little, that you won't give when you have much. Statistics show that. Listen, here, here's the way I put it in my notes today. Because we are often overwhelmed by life, we don't overflow with generosity. Can you relate to that today? 
I can relate to it. Brian, life is overwhelming. I have so much going on. We have so much to do. I'm overwhelmed by life. Because we're overwhelmed by life, we don't overflow with generosity. But catch this. And Brad actually began his message this way last week. Generosity does not begin with how much money you have in the bank. It doesn't begin with your social status. Generosity begins in the heart. That's where it begins. Jesus said it in Matthew 6, 21. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Quite frankly, we're not giving often because our heart's not in it. Our, our heart is somewhere else. Our heart is with us, our needs, our wants, all of that. That is where our heart is. And so we're, overflow, we're overwhelmed by life. And so because we're overwhelmed by life, we don't overflow with generosity. We feel like, you know, that exhortation to be generous is just for people who are at this stage in their life, or it's just for people who have this, or just for people who have their act together. And Paul says, no, it's not. The Macedonians were suffering. They were experiencing extreme poverty, and yet they overflowed. Paul's word, Holy Spirit's word, they overflowed with a wealth of generosity. So church, catch this. When we let our circumstances control our generosity, we give in to fear and not to faith. When we let our circumstances control our generosity, we give in to fear and not to faith. We fear we won't have enough. We fear we won't be able to pay the bills. We fear our kids won't be happy if I give them all of this. We fear what others will think if I don't have this or don't have that. We give in to fear and we don't live lives of faith. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, for God did not give us a spirit or God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and of love, and of self-control. You, you see, church, we are able to be generous with our time, with our talents, and when our, with our resources when we believe that God is the source of everything we give. When we truly believe that, and we believe that by faith, we are able, like the Macedonians, to freely be generous and meet the needs of others. Let me remind you of the words of Jesus, and I'm going to put it in context so some of our contextual people, please bear with me. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus says, Give, and it will be given to you. I know he's talking about the context of loving, judging, forgiving, showing compassion, all of that. But Jesus says, when you give, in a way that is not natural for you to give. You give, and then it will be given to you. Here's the way we treat giving sometimes. Okay, God, if you give it to me, I'll give it to somebody else. But I'm not going to give it until you give it to me. And God says, you got the order mixed up. God says, give and then it will be given to you. By the way, notice how he describes it there in the passage. He said, good measure, overflowing, shall it be given to you. And so what's the truth? The truth is this. We shouldn't allow our circumstances to keep us from overflowing with generosity. Let me show you another truth. It's the third point in your outline. It's this. You can't overflow with generosity until you first give yourself to the Lord. Let me just let that sink in. You cannot, you will not overflow with generosity until you first give yourself 
to the Lord. I want you to see verse 5. I'm going to put it up on the screen. If you have your Bible in front of you, look at it. Paul's talking about the Macedonians again. How in the world could these Macedonians, and I know I'm being repetitive, but I want this to sink in. How could these Macedonians who were suffering severe affliction, that were experiencing extreme poverty, how could they insist on demonstrating generosity? Notice what Paul says. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord then by the will of God to us. Okay, Paul's wording is a little freaky there. And so here's Brian's translation. We have Brian's translation. Is that the verse I have Brian's translation? I think so, yeah. Here's Brian's translation. And they gave far more than we ever expected. Why? Because they first of all gave themselves to the Lord. Here's what Paul is saying. They were able to be extremely, overwhelmingly, overflowingly, generous because they had given themselves to God. The emphasis on the word or on the verse is found in the word themselves. They realized that the most important gift that they could give to God was themselves. It was the most important thing. So, so, so catch this. If you, listen, if you don't hear anything else I say today, catch this, all right? The simple truth is this, God doesn't need your money to meet the needs of this church, to reach the people in Hollywood, support missions around the world. He doesn't need your money, he doesn't need your time, he doesn't need your talents. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the wealth in every mine. All of the gold is his. All of the silver is his. God's not up in heaven today wringing his hand saying, boy, I hope Hollywood Community Church reaches their budget. If they don't reach their budget, I don't know what I'm going to do. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't need it. He's got everything he needs. Why then does he ask us for it? The simple truth is this. What God wants is not your time, not your talents, not your money. God wants you. He wants you. He wants me. So I was thinking how to illustrate that. Vicki and I were were talking this morning, and we thought about our wedding. So in just a couple of weeks, Vicki and I celebrate our 35th wedding anniversary. Can can you imagine? Can you imagine the crowns this lady's going to reap in heaven for living 35 years with me? And if you think I'm exaggerating, I'm not exaggerating, all right? 35 years ago, we stood at an altar like this. Our pastor, Dr. Held Henniger, was there. And it's so funny, we were talking about this today. Most of you know that I'm a twin brother, right? My twin brother's name's Bruce. So during, during the practice of the wedding ceremony, he would continually look at me and say, Bruce, do you take Vicky to be your wedded wife? And Vicky would say, no, 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 it's Brian. And a few moments later, he would say, and Bruce, do you do this? And we're like, no, 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 it's Brian. We were scared to death at the end of the ceremony. We were going to walk out, and Bruce was going to be married to Vicki. And it wasn't going to be me. He was going to be married to her. But on that day, I looked at Vicki, and I gave myself to her. Vicki, I commit myself to you for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health to love and to cherish till death do us part. And she gave herself to me that day. I was a 21-year-old kid. I was 21, right? I think I was 21, right? I think I was 21, yeah. I think so. I was a 21-year-old kid. I had no idea what that meant, church. I had no idea what the next 35 years were going to mean in our life. I had no idea at that moment that God was going to pick us up from the United States and send us to Mexico City, away from our families, and I would be the only support Vicki would have family for 10 years, and she would desperately need me to be there. When I made that commitment that day, I didn't know that. I didn't know that a few years, some eight years after marriage, God would give us a disabled daughter who would would live with us for 25 years until God takes her home, that we would look at nights without sleep and difficulties. And I would have to be there with her each and every step of the way. 
I didn't know the time that it would take. I didn't know the talents that it would take. I didn't know the recourse or the resources that it would take. I knew at that moment that I was committing my life to her, and she committed her life to me. It began with us, first of all, giving ourselves to each other. You see, the reason God asks for our resources and God asks for our time and God asks for our talents is not because he's a beggar and he needs us. He wants us. And he knows that we are so wrapped up in those things that if we're not careful, those things are more important to us than him. And God says, here's what I want. I want you to demonstrate to me that I am the most important person in your life. I'm more important than your time. I'm more important than your family. I'm more important than your future. I'm more important than your bank account. By the way, I can give you all of those things. But I want you to live as I live to you. I want you to give yourself to me. We sing that song All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Do you mean that when you sing that? Are there just certain parts of your life you say, okay, God, I give you this and this and this, but this over here is mine. I, I just, I don't trust you with it. I don't trust you with it, God. And we don't give ourselves completely to him. You see, this morning, What God wants more than anything else is for you and I wholeheartedly, unreservedly, unashamedly to say, Jesus, I'm yours, all of me, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, until you, by death, take me home to you. I am yours. The Macedonians got it. Paul says they were able to demonstrate generosity because they first gave themselves to God. And once you give yourself to God, the rest is just gravy, hey? Eh? <laughs> the rest is just residual stuff. Once you've made that commitment of completely giving yourself to the Lord. There's a fourth principle that we see in the passage, and I'm done. The fourth principle is this. Let me me go back and review. You can see the second one. The first one is don't let your circumstances keep you from overflowing with generosity. Secondly, you can't overflow with generosity until you first give yourself to God. That's where it starts. And there's one more. Overflowing generosity is a grace. It's given to you and me by God. I'd love to have you go home and before you turn on the TV this afternoon or fall asleep on the couch or whatever you're going to do, I'd love to have you read through this passage because you're going to notice that there are two words that are used repeatedly in the passage. The first I've already mentioned is the word overflow. Overflow is found four times in the passage, and you can find that it's not always translated overflow, but it's there. The other word is the word grace. Grace is found four times in this passage. It's found in verse 1, it's found in verse 4, it's found in verse 6, and it's found in verse 7. Notice what Paul says in verse 1. I'll put it up on the screen. Paul says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches in Macedonia. Notice Paul doesn't say, we want you to know about the generosity of these churches. Paul said, we want you to know about God's grace. The word among there has the idea of God's grace that has been manifested to them. Paul says, we want you to see how, they, how God is manifesting his grace in their life. In verse 7 We read it, but as you excel, as you overflow in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in all love for you, see that you excel, see that you overflow in this act of, what? Grace also. What is grace? 
Grace is not something that you and I deserve. It's not something that we fabricate. It's not something that we make. It's something that God gives to us. It's completely undeserved for you and I are saved by grace. We don't deserve grace. God freely gives us grace. But God says that this act of demonstrating generosity, this act of overflowing with generosity is not something that you have or maybe somebody else has because that's just their demeanor and that's who they are and and they can be generous, but that's not the way God made me. No, here's what Paul is saying. God didn't make any of us that way. We're all selfish. We all think of our own needs first. It's not natural for us to be generous. The only way we can be generous is by the grace of God. For God to demonstrate His grace in us. Overflowing generosity is an act of grace. We simply make ourselves available in God through His sovereignty. God, through his unlimited provision, uses us as a conduit to meet the needs of his church and to meet the needs of others. It's not something you and I can do. It's not something you're going to walk out here today and say, okay, Vic, let's be generous from now on. What do you think? No, it's not going to happen because tomorrow your flesh is going to take over and you're going to see something you want or think you need, and it's going to override any desire on your part. You need Jesus. You need the grace of God in order for this to happen. That's the only way that it can take place. So you say, Brian, where, where are you guys going with this? So we're being, as a staff, we're being coached by a gentleman by the name of Patrick Johnson. We'll probably have Patrick here sometime. Patrick leads an organization called Generous Church. He's working with pastors all over the, the United States. He's become a good friend. And Patrick has challenged me and he's challenged Jose, not on a church level, but on a personal level. He's challenged us with this thought. He looked at me, looked at Jose, and he said this, I challenge you every single day to wake up in the morning and ask God to give you an opportunity to be generous. Not just on Sundays when you come to church, but every day, ask God, help me to be generous. Now that doesn't mean, please don't understand, that doesn't mean that I walk out of the house with a bill of cash in my hand and I'm just walking and giving it to people as I go. Number one, Vicki would shoot me if I did that, all right? Here's what it does mean, though. It means that I'm constantly looking for opportunities to demonstrate generosity, So somebody offends me and I'm hurt and they don't deserve to be forgiven. But because of the grace that God gives me, I'm able to show generosity to them and forgive them. Someone at the store butts in front of me and I'm in a hurry and they're in a hurry and they butt in front of me and my first indication is to let them know what I think. But I sit back and I demonstrate generosity to them. And I love on them. And I be Jesus to them. Or maybe I'm buying lunch. And there's somebody outside who doesn't have anything. And I purchase lunch for that person. The idea is this, that I live my life looking for an opportunity to demonstrate generosity. To overflow with generosity. Why would I do that? Why would you do that? Because that's who Jesus is. Every day of your life, you have a loving God who overflows generosity to you and wakes up in the morning using an anthropomorphism that God, obviously God doesn't wake up, but God starts the day every day wanting, desiring to show his love, his grace, his mercy, his, dem- his, his generosity in your life, and he cannot wait to show that to you. Why? Because that's his character. That's who he is. And he longs to do that. I sit back and think, what would happen if the city in the city of Hollywood What would happen at Hollywood Community Church if we sat back and said, okay, God, every day I want to be generous. I want to demonstrate whole life, overflowing generosity to my spouse, to my kids, to my neighbor who aggravates the snot out of me, 
to my boss that I can barely handle, to people in need. I want to be Jesus. You see, church, the simple truth is this. The more you surrender yourself to Jesus, the more he enables you to share your time, share your talents, and share your resources with others. The challenge to the Corinthians, the challenge to us is to not be stingy. The challenge to us is to live and act like Jesus, who, by the way, is the most generous person that I know. And I want to live and act and respond like him. He deserves it. He deserves my very best. He deserves a surrendered life. He deserves all that I am and all that I hope to be. He's worth it. And by the way, the caveat at the end of all of this is God sits back and says, you know what, if you do all of this, I'll take care of your needs. Don't worry about your needs. I'm going to take care of your needs, and I'm going to give you joy, and I'm going to give you peace, and I'm going to give you trust, even if the Romans persecute you, even if you lose your job, even if you don't know how you're going to make it, I got you. Because remember, I own everything, and I long to be generous to you. That's the kind of church that we want to be. And I think if we become that, there's no limit to what God can do in and through us in the city of Hollywood as we live out the truth of the gospel, not just on Sunday, but Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And we demonstrate that not just here, but we demonstrate it in our job. And we live out the truth of the gospel in our job, and in our home, and in our neighborhood. My friends, that's when we're going to make a difference in our community and in our world. Would you stand with me today? Jonas and the team is coming, and we're going to sing a closing song. So, so let me say this as they come. If you're here today and there's never been a time in your life that you have, have knowingly repented of your sins, realized your need of Jesus Christ, and by faith reached out to Jesus as your Savior, your Redeemer, your friend, I would encourage you to do that this morning. We'll have leaders down front that would love to take the word of God and show you how that can happen. You can do it in your heart of hearts, right where you are, by just surrendering yourself to God. But, but for you to say, give me Jesus, is for you to open up your life and say, okay, Jesus, I need you. I desperately need you in my life. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you. I trust you. I accept you. Be my Lord and Savior. Maybe you say, Brian, I've already done that in my life, but I really haven't just surrendered myself to God. So, so, so here's what I'd like to do. Let's just make an altar out of these steps today. And I'd encourage you to come and just put yourself on the altar and say, okay, God, I give myself to you. I dedicate myself, my marriage, my family, my future. I dedicate it to you. God, help me as I dedicate myself to you to be a vessel through whom you can use. I promise you, God will use you. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to not only believe it, help us to live it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.